So welcome, welcome to AAM's workshop, The Importance of Animal Rights Movement Prisoner Support. In this program, guest speaker Joseph Buddenberg discusses the three stages of prisoner support, which is pretrial, incarceration, and post-prison, how to stay vegan in prison. And he's gonna talk about his story, life while incarcerated, what to expect and how to prepare. So I'm Michelle Granberg and I am your moderator tonight. I'm a mentor and team member with Animal Activism Mentorship. I'm located in New Jersey and I've been vegan and an activist for over five years. AAM's mission is to eradicate violence and build a culture of empathy and compassion, which ultimately results in animal liberation. We strive to build a global community of activists through our free online program dedicated to pairing experienced mentors with those who want to increase knowledge, gain experience, and develop confidence in their activism. Additionally, we offer free workshops that train and educate our mentors, mentees, and the public on various aspects of animal rights activism. And we're proud to announce our strategic alliance with one of the oldest animal rights organizations in the world, Farmed Animal Rights Movement, or FARM. If you're interested in becoming a mentor or a mentee or want to get involved, please visit our website, Animal Activism Mentorship, and follow both AAM on, and FARM on social media. Okay, so we're gonna get into it now. I'd like to introduce our guest speaker. Joseph Buddenberg has been an activist for nearly two decades. He was twice indicted on charges of animal enterprise terrorism. He served 21 months in federal prison for liberating 6,000 animals from fur farms. He continues to campaign against the fur industry today. And after Joseph speaks, we of course will have a Q&A portion. So stay tuned for that. Feel free to put your questions in the chat as we go, or you can hold them for when we open up for that portion, but we'd love to get your questions answered. All right, so Joseph, if you're all ready, go ahead and take it away. Okay, great. So, um, so yeah, like, like she said, I'm Joseph Buddenberg, been an activist for about 15 or 16 years, been vegan for 19 years. Um, and sort of the activist culture that I came out of, you know, there was more maybe pressure campaigns, more direct action. Um, um, you know, since, since the eighties and nineties, there's been constant repression against the animal rights movement, um, grand juries, arrests, conspiracy cases. Um, in my case, uh, the first time I was arrested by the FBI was 2009 for a pressure campaign against a uh, vivisection that was occurring at the University of California. And we we're using a diversity of tactics, uh, mostly like home demonstrations against vivisectors and uh, trustees. And um, the Animal Enterprise Terrorism Act is a 2006 law that was sort of like meant to criminalize like all forms of animal activism that affect um, corporations and private industries bottom line. Um, so prosecutors sort of wanted to use our case. It was me and three others. We were called the AETA for prosecutors sort of wanted to use our case as like a test case under this Animal Enterprise Terrorism Act, which was like a very controversial law at the time, um, had never been used. And uh, that case ended up getting dismissed. We were, we were facing five years in prison, um, hired a really good team of lawyers. Um, we had a prisoner support crew that just did amazing work. Finding, finding sympathetic lawyers, the National Lawyers Guild, um, raising funds on our behalf and uh, fighting the case. And ultimately we beat it. Um, and then I sort of like tried to reintegrate into the movement, sort of took some, took some time off. And then in 2013, I had, um, me and a friend had decided to uh, set out to essentially destroy the fur industry through a, uh, just acts of direct action and liberation, econo both economic sabotage and um, liberation of animals from fur farms. So mink are native to North America. Um, they can survive in the wild. They're captive bred wild animals. So we you know, went to several fur farms, opened as many cages as we could um, and liberated over like over 6,000 animals from these fur farms. Um, two years later, I was arrested by the FBI again on animal enterprise terrorism. We, fa we uh, faced 10 years in prison, and um, I, uh, I pled guilty, and we did. I did 24 months. I got a 24-month sentence, and my co-defendant got a 21-month sentence. 
So that's sort of my background. Um, and I think I learned a lot through those experiences about like prison support for mostly from the perspective of someone facing charges. But since then I've also done like um, prisoner support for other people that are facing charges. So sort of wanted to share those tips. So sort of like three stages of prison support. I mean, there's like the pretrial stage, um, you know, generally like, it will ripple through the activist community. The government will put out a press release um, and people will be facing charges. Most important thing is that, you know, generally the government, the police, the FBI will make visits to their friends and associates. So it's really important that people know their rights and know that they don't have to talk uh, to police or the FBI. So just kind of assert your rights, say I'd like to talk to a lawyer. Um, same thing goes for defendants. Um, if you're arrested, do not talk to the police. Uh, the animal rights movement has a sort of strict policy of su only support for non-cooperators. So if you do cooperate with the government, you'll never be trusted in an activist scene again, and you'll, only hurt, you'll really only hurt yourself and your co-defendant and sort of damage your, damage your chances of uh, fighting your case. Um, in the pretrial stage, it's really important like that the movement sort of unite um, hire lawyers for, for people that are facing charges. Most of this applies to like, you know, serious felony cases where people are facing like, you know, sometimes decades in prison for liberating animals or, you know, threatening the industries that we all hate. <laughs> and, um, you know, lawyers can be pretty expensive. So, uh, people can chip in, do fundraisers and just kind of like, I think that's super critical that people, um, try to raise funds for, competent defense. Um, you know, uh, an experienced lawyer can mean the difference between, you know, years or decades in prison for a defendant and someone going free and re-entering the movement. Um, so yeah. And, um, so that's kind of, that covers a little bit of the pretrial stuff. Um, when there is a conviction, some people choose to take it to trial. Some people take a non-cooperating plea deal, which is what I did. Uh, I was facing 10 years in prison and the government offered me 24 months. So I figured I don't really want to roll the dice. And a lot of times if you take a trial, you get punished more severely. Um, so I took the deal 24 months in prison and then uh, prisoner support for an incarcerated movement uh, person and really involves like writing letters, sending books, just kind of giving them a lot of emotional support because prison's a pretty like bleak environment. Um, striking up friendship with the prisoner. Um, that can be very individual. I mean, I like to receive like postcards, uh, nature photographs, things like that really brightened the day and made the, made the experience a little more, a little less miserable for me. Um, yeah. And then you do the time, I, you know, you do the time and you get out and, you know, as you would guess, like prison is a super traumatic sort of experience. And so, the post the post prison aspect is super important too. like it may be helping the person to reintegrate into the movement maybe helping them find jobs a lot of times as a felon you can't find it's not it's not easy to find work housing um that's going to be individual to the prisoner um everyone's going to have individual needs depending on how much time they have um yeah so you know just uh whatever ways people feel comfortable to support, like don't, don't feel like you have to do everything for the prisoner. Like when I was in, when I was in prison, I got, you know, thousands of letters from all over the world. Like the, the support was huge. Um, and so, you know, don't feel like you have to carry the burden or do it all. Um, do whatever is within your comfort level. Um, yeah. There's also, uh, I want to say like staying vegan in prison and can be very difficult. Like I had some trouble at some facilities. Um, so whenever you see a action alert that says, you know, call the jail for this person, this person's being denied vegan food, always do it because these prisons, these facilities are like super terrified of outside pressure and lawsuits. So a lot of times they will budge. Um, I was in five or six different facilities and all but one just budged immediately. And the food service director would come to me and, you know, ask me to make a meal plan, basically like, what can you eat? <laughs> Um, one of them, I had a more difficult time and I had to litigate it and that, that was kind of an arduous process. 
But uh, yeah, if you do see uh, an action alert uh, prisoner being denied vegan food, make that phone call. You wouldn't think a phone call would mean much, but it actually, it actually has a huge effect. Um, trying to think. Um, I sort of wanted to talk about some current prisoners that we have right now. Um, Marius Mason, a lot of people don't know about his case. Um, transgender animal and earth liberation activist uh, serving 22 years in prison for acts of sabotage um, on, on behalf of the earth and the animals. Um, they've been in since like, he's been in since like 2006. And I think he's got a few more years to go. Um, so it's super important that people write to them. Uh, it can, I think for a lot of long-term prisoners, what I've heard is that they sort of get a lot of support in the beginning, then like as people leave the movement, it can be it can be tougher to get that long term support. I mean, that's a huge commitment to to a prisoner to 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 advocate for them for you know fifteen or twenty years. So, uh, supportmariusmason.org is the site to check out for for Marius and send them a letter, send them a book if you can, if you're able to, to show them some love. Um, yeah, and like I said, repression is is pretty much always constant throughout the movement. Like if there's if there's hard hitting pressure campaigns that are gonna affect the uh, industries and uh, people are liberating animals, animals are property in our society. So um, I don't think we should like moralize about people that commit illegal actions because you know, they're just doing what is in their heart and what's right. And oftentimes it's very effective and it threatens the industries. So repression is constant. Um, I think it ebbs and flows depending on um, what, what we're doing as a movement, how effective we're being. Um, so yeah, um, unoffensive animal dot, dot is another site to check out. Like they also include like international prisoners and we have a few prisoners from, from Europe that could deserve our support as well. Um, I don't know. I, I can't remember the specifics of their charges or their sentences, but that's a really good resource for, uh, for finding the addresses and the individual needs of these prisoners. Trying to think what else I left out. Um, yeah. Yeah, I mean, I would just advise like, you know, if you do, if you do find uh, yourself indicted, just know that you have a movement like behind you, thousands of people that support you. You're sort of representative of a international movement for liberation. Um, it's very heroic work that you did and uh, people will have your back and the movement will take care of you. So it's not as, it's not as scary as it sounds initially. Like when I was arrested, I was terrified, but it ended up, you know, being a survivable experience. Prison is survivable and yeah. So I don't know if I talked about like, yeah, post-prison stuff. I mean, I feel like that's ongoing and that's individual to the prisoner. I think it's really important. That's sort of like something that I feel we don't talk about enough as a movement. Like, um, you know, people, people doing years in prison can, can really, it, it can be a traumatic experience and that could be, um, there could be an ongoing need for, for like, you know, therapy and things like that to, and just, and just helping prisoners to reintegrate into the movement and in whatever ways they want to. So that's been really helpful for me at least to be able to like, um, you know, continue my activism and, uh, not let the sort of government repression, uh, you know, have that chilling effect that I think it's intended to have. So I feel like I'm rambling, but yeah, if anyone has Q and A or questions, do that. Maybe I'll ask you a couple of questions first, and then and we have yeah. we do have some questions coming in. So that's thank you, Joseph, so much um, for letting us into to hearing about that. Um, maybe what was some of the response from other prisoners when they found out why you were there? Was there any specific memorable response? Um, they're, they're generally very supportive. Like when you first get to prison, the prisoners kind of want to check you. They want to see some paperwork basically to make sure that you don't have one of two things. So uh, you don't have a sex offense and you're not a, you're not a snitch. You're not a cooperator. So they want to see some paperwork. And then once, once that happens, it's just, you know, they kind of leave you alone and it's 
they're, they're very respectful. Uh, I think prisoners very much respect like someone they see as a stand-up individual, someone that stood up for what they believed in and didn't didn't give in to the government, didn't cooperate with the government against their co-defendants. So I had a I had a decent time with other prisoners. Not so much with the staff. The staff were very difficult. Um, the staff can like withhold your mail and mess with you, especially if you have a political case. They can really like make your time a little harder. So the inmates were cool, staff not so much. So you're saying some of the inmates actually, did they actually empathize with you? Was anybody sort of on the same side? Un understand? Um, yeah, I mean, I, I had a, I was in with a couple fellow political prisoners. Um, uh, there was a communist guy, Bill Dunn, that I was in with, and we, we were really good friends. Um, so he, you know, he was on the same page as me politically. He was vegan and he was, uh, he was very helpful. He, he was, he was very helpful in the beginning. That was like the beginning of my sentence. So that was the time when I was like in the most like sort of shock about, you know, this is two years of my life, <laughs> but that, that was a very important friendship. And then, yeah, I had, I had a few other prisoners tell me like, that's very heroic. Thank you for doing that. Um, yeah. And you were talking about, you know, reintegrating back into activism. So like the very first time you out of prison went to do activism for the first time, what was that like? How, like, did you have hesitation, resistance? Were you nervous? Well, at, at first it's very, a lot of times they will like impose a period of probation, especially like a federal sentence. So my, I was on pr probation for two years. And so I couldn't really do much. I would go to the occasional protest, but I didn't want to like risk the chance of being violated. But once I was off probation, um, yeah, it was it was much easier to uh, to get back involved and start working on campaigns again. I've been working on a lot of the um, fur campaigns, a lot of the fur victories that have happened recently. Mm. That's been that's been very exciting. I've been super stoked about that. Yeah, we're so glad you're back. And and do you think that it's made you a better activist? in some ways um experiencing the repression you mean the whole experience. uh yeah yeah i think it's i think it's made me more um more critical of like thinking about you know is this you know is this the right is this the right tactic is this going to work is this going to be effective um i feel like in the in the early years of my activism i was kind of just like all over the place and you know maybe doing things that felt good but weren't necessarily effective and uh, yeah, I feel like it's made me uh, it's made me a smarter activist. So let's go to some of the questions that are coming in the chat, and then folks can also raise your hand once we sort of get through those, and you can ask Joseph directly. Um, but a question, I'm sorry, I didn't write down who it was from, but how can activists doing open rescue, civil disobedience, and direct action avoid or have the best case against um, AETA? That's tough. I mean, often the um, the open rescue and civil disobedience cases will not be charged under ATA. ATA is specifically a federal law. A lot of times, the open rescues and the like civil disobedience lockdowns will just be charged on a state level by a you know small town prosecutor. And one thing I've really noticed over the years, and this goes a, open rescue is not necessarily a new tactic. It goes back to the '90s. Um, a lot of times the industries and the CEOs are scared to get up there and testify and they're, they don't want the conditions exposed. So they'd rather just sweep it under the rug and not even have a trial. So what you'll see often with open rescues is um, the charges are getting completely dismissed or just a really good plea deal of like community service and, you know, some unsupervised probation. So open, I feel like pe defendants that are in a, in a open rescue case are in a really good, a really good position as far as, as far as the legal system goes. Um, as far as ATA charges, um, there's been some attempts to challenge that law, like by the center for constitutional rights and the judges, it's always failed. The judges have always struck it down and upheld the law. Um, I, and a lot of the legal, a lot of the lawyers that I've talked to feel like it's, uh, definitely unconstitutional, but the courts apparently don't feel that way. Um, the best thing for fighting, like I said earlier, the best thing for fighting an, an AETA case is um, experienced proper representation. And it may not be an, it, it's probably not going to be an animal rights lawyer. It's going to be a, you know, a criminal lawyer that has 30 or 40 years of experience. Um, in my first AETA case, that's what happened is we put together a really good team of famous civil rights attorneys who, who got that case thrown out. 
And then in the second case, I, we didn't have a, a paid legal team. We just had like public defenders and they sort of just wanted to take us, take a, take the first plea deal that we were offered. Um, one thing I think would be helpful um, for fighting repression is I think people should um, try to have like a general fund set up. I know that's an idea that's been thrown around for many years since even my first case. Um, because a lot of times when there's an arrest, the movement will be scrambling around for funds and sort of like trying to figure out how to support this person, how to raise the funds. And that can be a lot of money to raise for fighting a huge case like that. So a general defense fund that can just be put aside for the next time this happens, you never know when it's going to happen. It could be next week or could be five years from now, but it'd be great to have that for the next person that faces these charges. Um, and that, that could be something that people are just constantly like thinking about and, and donating to. Because like I said earlier, um, you know, proper representation and, and amazing lawyers can mean the difference between, uh, you know, a lot of prison time for these people and, and uh, walking away. There was, a, there was a case in Salt Lake City years, years back where people were accused of some economic sabotage and liberating animals from fur farms. And they put together an amazing legal team and they had, they had two cooperators in their case testifying against them, two former activists who had turned state's evidence. And um, they beat the case just on the you know, power and prowess of their attorneys, their legal team. So. Great, so that was Myra's question. Did that answer, that, that answered it? Yeah, that, that and then some. Okay, good. So the next question from Juan, are you limited to what you can do as an activist since you have a record now? Um, I think it's, it's always important to think about whether you're a felon or whether you're a convicted terrorist or not. I think it's always important to, to, be, to be knowledgeable about the law and what the legal boundaries are. And not even just that, but also just what you're willing to accept as an activist. Like some people have, you know, children or they might have companion animals or they might have you know other other sorts of responsibilities that make it a little difficult to take these you know bigger risks um for me right now i'm yeah i'm, I'm purely sticking to the legal route and uh i think the culture and the movement has shifted whereas like you know i was, I was telling trey this earlier like back in the day a lot of the hard-hitting uh fur campaigns weren't, weren't working but now it seems like they're we're all folding quickly through like just strictly legal tactics. So that's been, that's been a shift that I didn't really foresee. And so it doesn't, it doesn't really, I don't think that there's always a place for underground action, but I don't think it's as necessary as it once was. Great, great question. So uh, what did you exchange with the feds in order to get your sentence reduced from 10 year to two year sentence? Uh, I didn't exchange any information. It's um, there's for animal rights, prisoner support and political prisoner support in general, there's a policy of non-cooperation. Like you can't, you can't exchange information with, with the government, but um, no, generally what happens is, you know, you'll be facing a maximum sentence of 10 or 20 years and they'll come to you and just say, if you guys plead guilty or we'll reduce your sentence and it's really up to the individual defendant and their support team and their lawyers, whether they want to like roll the dice and risk, risk the serious time and possibly beat it. Or if they just want to take the plea deal. In my case, I felt like they had a good enough case against me to uh, convict. So myself and my co-defendant both agreed to take the non-cooperating plea deal and just wrap it up and, you know, not have to face so much more time. Great. So there's there's a, an experience here that Dee Dee is writing out. And basically, her question is about um, giving your ID to the police. Can you talk about that? You know, do you have to do that? And talking about being on private property and trespassing, you know, what do we need to be aware of and careful of with that? That's not something I'm so familiar with. I know that's state to state. That's um, different states have different laws on whether you have to provide ID when the police, you know, detain you or say they're investigating. Um, I had an experience recently um, in Texas. I was at a YSL protest shortly before they went for a free protesting and a cop came up to us. There were two of us that they detained. The rest of us were had already left. Um, two of us they detained and uh, asked us to sign sort of a stay away order from the mall. Person with me accepted, signed it and was just banned from the mall and able to walk away. I sort of try to assert 
my rights and said, no, I'm not. I don't feel like I have to. I feel like it's my constitutional right to be here. Um, and I was arrested on trespassing charges. So still dealing with that right now. That, that was I was arrested like four or five months ago. I'm still facing uh, some misdemeanor trespass charges from that. Um, I believe that California has really good um, laws around protesting in malls and on private property. I feel like there's been some good case law to the Ninth Circuit. And um, so it's state to state. You should definitely consult with a lawyer as far as that. There are a lot of good lawyers, both in the animal rights movement and from the National Lawyers Guild that will be free to or happy to talk to you. And so can you just repeat the name of the current prisoners? I want to make sure we, that we have that in the chat. I know it's being posted to make sure current prisoners that we need to support and any other website. So maybe Trey or someone can put them in the, make sure they're in the chat. Okay, okay cool. So it's MariusMason.org. Marius Mason um, is a transgender earth and animal liberation activist serving, I think, a 22 year sentence. So that's M-A-R-I-U-S-M-A-S-O-N.org would be her website, would be his website. Um, and then there's another prisoner who's pretrial, doesn't have an active support campaign, just kind of like awaiting charges. Joseph Dibby was a fugitive for about 20 years, um, accused of setting fire to an empty slaughterhouse, the only the only horse slaughterhouse in the state in Redmond, Oregon. And uh, the slaughterhouse shut down after that action. And Joseph Dibby was a fugitive for like 15 or 20 years, recently captured, and is now facing charges for some pretty serious charges of arson, maybe facing several years in prison. So that's another prisoner. If that ends up in a conviction and he ends up going to prison, we should definitely support him in any ways that we can. So on the flip side of that, sort of focusing on the animals, what can you describe the feeling of liberating animals when you let those 6,000 animals go? What was that like? What was it like for them? Uh, I would have to say it's like the most rewarding experience of my life. Um, it was... Uh, sort of the culmination of everything that I believed in. Like, I feel like I spent a lot of time protesting outside of shops and stores and sort of, you know, demanding that places and these practices and that's great. And sometimes that works, um, but it's animal liberation is the most effective way to, to help animals, I believe. And um, yeah, it was an amazing feeling. The animals are, like I said, mink are just captive bred wild animals. They're native to this country and as soon as you open the cage, they're gone. Um, you know, there was, I remember reading newspaper articles that said like mink were sighted like five, 10 miles away the next day. So they just kept running. Uh, it, they didn't want to stop. Yeah, it was exactly. It was a, it was a beautiful feeling to see, like we would visit fur farms and uh, some of them were, were right along streams. And so, you know, mink are semi-aquatic animals. So it would, it, it was amazing to see them jump out of the cage and just start swimming away. It was you know, after a lifetime in a, in a tiny cage. That makes me want to cry just hearing about it. Must be, well, Still makes me want to cry. So. Oh my God, amazing, incredible. So um, there's a question, how much money was spent to defend your case? Uh, the first case, the first case, the ATA4 case, I was arrested in 2009 on that. And um, we spent $25,000. It was great because Three of the lawyers were pro bono. They represented my co-defendants for free. Uh, the government had a little bit of a stronger case against me, so my support team felt like I should hire a lawyer. Um, and we, yeah, we hired him at twenty-five thousand. That was all money raised pretty quickly. That was a uh, when you think about it, a movement of you know hundreds of thousands or millions of people. That money can be raised pretty easily. Everyone can pitch in a few dollars, even. Um, the second case was we had public defenders, we had court appointed attorneys. So that was, we didn't spend anything. Um, we raised money, but you know, that money goes towards like staying vegan in prison. Staying vegan in prison can be pretty difficult. Like, uh, you know, you're pretty much subsisting on commissary oatmeal, peanut butter and ramen noodles. So uh, that requires, uh, you know, you have to buy, you have to pretty much buy your diet and then buying stamps and stuff like that. So most of the costs for the second case just came from like direct prison support. 
How did you go about choosing a lawyer? Did you say? Um, the first time we were in the Bay Area and there was like a real culture of radical civil rights attorneys, this guy, Tony Serra, who had represented like a lot of um, former progressive movements like the Black Panthers, um, you know, the American Indian movement. He's had a lot of experience defending political cases. So that was a guy that we definitely wanted on our legal team. Um, and then my lawyer as well had so much experience in radical movements and defending against sort of the FBI in the era of like COINTELPRO and sort of the dirty tactics that the FBI was using in the 70s. Um, so, you know, you, I think ideally you want uh, a lawyer with as much experience as possible. Can you just and then the second time we didn't, we didn't have the funds to raise attorneys, unfortunately. So we went with what the court gave us. And just repeat what the charge was that ultimately you went to prison for and when that was just for. It's a very Kafkaesque Orwellian charge called conspiracy to violate the Animal Enterprise Terrorism Act. And um, they couldn't actually prove that I was at any of these farms. They didn't catch me on any of the farms. Um, what they need to get a conspiracy conviction is uh, an agreement between two or more people to break the law. Um, with a using a facility of interstate commerce. So that could be cell phone, internet. All they really have to show to get a conspiracy conviction under this law is um, an agreement and a sort of a few steps towards that agreement. And like, in my case, they never caught me at the fur farms. I don't think they could place me at the fur farms. They didn't have any physical evidence, but they were able to use like, um, like a, they used a sneak and peek warrant. They lied to a federal judge and got a sneak and peek warrant, which is like a delayed notification warrant where they don't have to show you that they searched your property for 30 days. And they found, you know, some fur industry literature, bolt cutters, wire cutters, things like that. So that was enough to get a, you know, conspiracy conviction. All they had to show was that we were, yeah. you know, maybe up to no good. <laughs> do, you, do they have video cameras at fur farms nowadays? Like they think? Surprisingly, surprisingly, most of them don't. A lot of them don't even have fences. There was a recent piece in the New York Times Magazine by this journalist, Sonia Shaw, and she visited a fur farm. Um, her, her story mostly focused on like the threat of COVID and sort of how, you know, these are a public health disaster. And she said, essentially, she was just able to walk on to a Utah fur farm. Um, no gate, no fence, no security, essentially. And, uh, I found that very interesting because Utah is one of the states that's been hardest hit by like the animal liberation front, the mink farm raids in the past, and they still haven't really made any effort to protect these farms. So we have more questions coming in the chat. How do you think social media can be used for the most effective with different tactics in a way that the movement earlier didn't have to their advantage? And when, when, it, comes, when it comes to charges and arrests of activists? Uh, yeah, social media is very helpful. I mean, creating um, with prison support specifically, when there's an arrest, I mean, I, I felt like blasting it out on social media is very helpful. You know, a Facebook page, a Instagram, just constantly reminding people that this person is in prison and is a part of our movement and needs support. Um, I think it's made activism very easy. It's just, you know, everybody's on social media. So it's like, made it more welcoming for people to get involved. You can just create an event page. I, I remember in the past when I first got involved in activism, sort of, you know, maybe in the era of MySpace or even pre-MySpace, we kind of had to just flyer the area and put flyers on telephone poles and, you know, get it out word of mouth. And so it's, I think social media has made things a lot easier, both in prison support and in activism. Absolutely, the ability to reach worldwide in an instant. Exactly. And Jenny, yeah, Jenny McQueen is, is with us, and she just wanted to oh, comment that there's trials happening in Canada too, pig trial four in Quebec, and judge's decision on February 24th, and pig trial three in uh, British Columbia starting in the summer. So we do want to make people aware of that if they can lend their support. Thanks for sharing that. Yeah, definitely support those folks. That's That's vital. I believe one of the slaughterhouses was shut down. Is that correct? Anybody have the answer to that? Jenny or Tatya with us? I mean, she's with us. I'll see you. 
Um, another question, are you fundraising right now for any of your current charges that you mentioned following the recent protests? Yeah, do you need funds? I think AAM and Farm already took care of that for me. So it was, uh, right. it was very nice. I got bailed out within 24 hours as soon as I saw the judge. And then um, right now I don't have a court date. They're just delaying. Um, I was arrested back in September, like I said, at YSL, and uh, they um, haven't haven't formally charged me yet, so we'll see what happens. But I think I have enough funds to take care of it. I don't imagine that it'll be more than maybe a few hundred dollars in fines and you know maybe a couple days in jail. I already did two, so I don't even I don't even think they would try to give me jail time. So so I'm good on that. But thank you for asking. Yeah, thank you for asking. That was uh, yeah, I don't know who that was. And David was also sharing the chat about um, meet meet the victims meet the victims Canada. There's a GoFundMe um, in the chat to support that. And um, I think you spoke talked about this, but when and where did you liberate the minks, and how were you so successful? Um, and what did the inmates think when you told them why you were sentenced? I know you already talked about that. Yeah. Um, so mink farms are usually in like the Midwest. Um, I think the biggest fur farming states in the U.S. are Utah, Wisconsin, and Michigan. Um, the industry has really changed. Like at the time I was liberating animals from fur farms, there were like 274 mink farms in the U.S. And I think there are much fewer now. A lot of them shut down because of COVID and the economic downturns and all these companies going fur free. Um, but yeah, like I alluded to earlier, very little security on these farms. I only saw of the of the 10 fur farms I liberated animals from, I only saw one fence. And that can be just cut with a pair of wire cutters, bull cutters. Um, uh, these fur farms are generally like dirty backyard operations, literally like in someone's backyard. Uh, no irrigation, just disgusting, just all the horrors you would imagine. So um, didn't really require much ingenuity or, or criminal skill, just kind of walk onto the farm and start opening cages. Um, yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, there's been hundreds of ALF actions against the fur industry over the years. Um, hundreds of thousands of animals liberated from fur farms. Mm. It's uh, very easy to pull off. And so can you say this is probably the most hopeful time you've ever seen since you've been fighting? Absolutely. All these like furriers, all these companies going for free, giant corporations that I never really expected. Like we worked super hard on Neiman Marcus here in, te in Texas. And um, I expected it to be a years long fight and they folded within a few months or I think 63 days. So, and then Dolce and Montclair going for free in the same week. It's amazing. Um, I really feel vindicated. Like I feel like I may see the end of the fur industry in my lifetime. It's, it's an amazing feeling. It's great. Yeah, everybody keep fighting. Don't don't let up now. I know in the 90s, people really thought they were finishing off the fur industry, like they had some success against Macy's and some other companies, and they kind of like let off the gas and started going towards like anti vivisection campaigns. Um, so it's super important that we continue the fight against fur and, you know, don't, um, don't declare victory too soon. We still have some, we still have a lot of work to do. So are there any, so some more questions for Joseph. Go ahead and, um, okay, Malcolm, you have your hand raised. Go ahead and ask your question. Um, hey, Joseph, how you doing? <laughs> hey, what's um, up, Malcolm? I just want to say, first off, uh, thanks for all your hard work and dedication to the animals. Uh, a lot of your work inspired a lot of stuff that I did in the past, so thanks for that. Um, Thank you, that means a lot to me. Yeah, um, so I have a couple questions here. Um, what is your best advice for um, avoiding arrest and detection during underground actions? I guess that's the first question. Um, only work with people you trust and have a very close bond with would be one. Um, knowledge of technology. Um, don't ever take a cell phone near a crime. I know there were some people in Utah that got arrested years ago. They brought their cell phones to the crime. Your cell phone's a tracking device. Um, uh, yeah, just being knowledgeable about maybe encryption technology. Um, 
only taking actions that you're absolutely certain that you can get away with. Like I wouldn't take unnecessary risks. You can always fight another day. Um, there were some fur farms I visited where, you know, they had, you know, floodlights and it was a for more fortified facility. You can go to another fur farm and do as much damage or liberate as many animals. So just knowing, knowing the limitations is, is super important. Um, great. <clears throat> great. Um, next part of the question here. Um, do, do, um, I guess uh, this is like kind of two parts. Um, what's your best advice for people starting off in underground direct actions for animals and how can they be most effective? And how can people interested in underground actions get over any mental blocks they have preventing them from engaging in direct action, I guess? That's really good questions. I feel like it, when I first started taking underground action, there was sort of this illusory thought that I'd have to build up to bigger and bigger actions. Like I started off just like, you know, maybe throwing bricks through butcher shop windows and doing like very petty stuff, feeling like if I were to do larger stuff, like maybe, you know, a fur farm liberation or elaborate or something that would require, you know, maybe a more psychological preparation than it really needed. Um, so my hope would be that people that, you know, want to see animal liberation start soon and go for the throat before they have, uh, you know, an FBI file and a surveillance file and, you know, can be a little more difficult when you're, when you're already being watched. Um, so, I mean, in a lot of ways, the fur farm liberations I did were felt safer and less risky than, you know, vandalizing a fur shop, whereas that might not have any effect at all, uh, very little effect. Uh, you know, there's passing cars, there's lights, there's security cameras. And you've been on fur farms, as you know, they're, they're not very secure operations. <laughs> no, so not I'd like some. What's that? I said not some, of, <clears throat> some of them are really not. I went to uh, one farm, it had no fence or anything, no cameras, nothing. So yeah, that's what, that's what I'm saying is, yeah, most of them have absolutely no security. I was saying earlier that I, I liberated animals from 10 fur farms. I only saw a fence once. So they're, uh, yeah. If I think if people knew how easy it was to, to, uh, empty these places, they'd spend a lot less time, you know, just doing the work that they're doing. Cause I, I spent a lot of years just doing, you know, work that was less effective. Yeah. All right, cool. Thanks. Appreciate it. So oh, uh, Barry has a question in the chat. Does PETA support you? Um, I never got any direct support from PETA. I think they ran into some trouble. Um, I believe they used to donate funds to political prisoners. And uh, there was a prisoner years ago, Rod Coronado, and they helped fund his uh, legal defense. But I think they sort of had some industry front groups. Um, I think I can't remember, Center for Cons or Center for Consumer Freedom and Center for the Defense of Free Enterprise and those kinds of groups were trying to like attack PETA for that and say they're connected to terrorists and trying to get their like tax exempt status and their 501c3 status taken away. So I think PETA has been a little more careful about, you know, how they navigate um, who they can support. I want to ask you how your family responded to the whole thing. Um, supported, if, that, if that's too personal, you don't have to answer it. <laughs> but no, it's okay. They were no, they were supportive. They were supportive. They were emotionally supportive. Yeah. Um, yeah, they were. They were great. They they knew that I was trying to do the right thing, and that you know I was motivated by a place of selflessness, and that I just wasn't wasn't really a criminal. <laughs> Okay, more questions. Myra, you have your hand up. Go ahead and ask. Yeah, um, I don't know if this is like legally something you can answer. I guess I was just wondering, I know you said that a lot of them were in people's backyards and I know that definitely increases like risk of getting caught and stuff like that. So I guess like what precautions were taken because I feel like that's a pretty risky thing to be doing like when someone's living right there. Yeah, um, I mean, some people work with a lookout. We did not. Um, you know, you sometimes open cages and then you just kind of like leave the shed and watch the house, look for lights, look for movement. Um, 
mink sound very loud within the shed when you know they're the their first taste of freedom they're 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 communicative they're loud they're chirping but like you know just feet away it, it's pretty silent i mean um it'd be very hard i think for, for a farmer to to catch someone they're not they're not really expecting it and i think mink are already generally a, a pretty loud animal like they're they're pretty vocal so um yeah and you get in and get out pretty fast i mean two people can liberate a thousand animals every 15 minutes. So you're not there very long and you're there in the middle of the night, hopefully when the farmer's dead asleep. So um, generally we would spend, you know, 30 minutes on a fur farm and we could liberate 2000 animals. Thank you. Yeah. Other questions? Have a question in the chat. Um, have you ever wanted to write a book, try to write a book on everything you've done and how it made you feel when you gave back the animals their freedom? Have you been invited to speak in other places, to write, to share your story on a wider level, other than being here with us tonight, of course, which is great. Yeah, currently, currently working on a book, actually, working on a book of uh, like communicate collections and sort of like uh, a little bit of my personal experience um, doing these actions. But I, I feel like a lot of this is like a forgotten history. There's not really much, um, there's there's not really a lot of knowledge of the history of like the animal rights movement and how hard we fought in the past. So I, I mainly want to share it for that reason, just to show people like what has been done and what's, what's possible. So yeah, con currently working on that. Hopefully that'll be out later this year. All right. I think you have some ready readers already. Myra says she would buy the book and read it. Thanks, course. Myra. <laughs> you have one sale already, pre-sale. Anybody <laughs> else? Who else has a question? Julia, ask your question. Maybe a kind of depressing question. I feel like stirs up emotions, but did you have to leave animals behind and how did that affect you if you did? Like, were you not able to free everyone? Yeah. Um, there have been fur farms in the past where individuals have completely emptied the fur farm. Um, but generally, you do have to leave animals behind. Some of these facilities have 20 or 30,000 animals or even more. I've, I've seen aerial views of, of facilities that have 100,000 mink. So... I was in a massive fur farm at one point and it would have been impossible to even for a team of 10 or 15 activists to, to liberate all the animals. So, um, a lot of times, uh, the best compromise I found was to liberate the breeding stock because the, um, the breeding stock is essential to the fur farm. Uh, these animals are bred for a genetic lineage for the quality of their pelt. They're not domesticated. It's all about the pelt quality. And so once you liberate the breeding stock, um, they sort of have no choice but to what they call pelt out. They have to sort of end the fur farm. Um, destroying the breeding cards and liberating the breeders is is always the most, I think, effective and the most rewarding way to do that. You know, when you do have to leave animals behind, it's heartbreaking. Um, and I think that was one of the reasons that I got caught actually is because like, you, you visit a fur farm, you liberate a couple thousand animals and you realize there's, you know, a few hundred more of these places and there's hundreds of thousands more animals in similar conditions and you can't, you don't want to leave them behind. Um, when you liberated them, do you know, like, I often think about animals being liberated and their survival in these places. I know you said there was a waterway, so they have a high chance of living their natural lives, but do you think that these animals and breeding and creating like where they're not supposed to be, um, do you think that, what do you think about that? Uh, I mean, yeah, mink are, mink are native to North America. They can survive in the wild. Um, there was a project years ago called the Mink Rehabilitation Project where activists had bought out a fur farm and, um, you know, essentially, essentially spent just a few, it wasn't very long, spent a few days rehabbing these animals and then released them into the wild. And the survivability rate was, you know, 
amazing. Um, yeah, the I can't remember the exact figures, but in my case in Discovery, it showed like the recapture rate, and it was very. I I think they would recapture like fifteen to twenty percent of the animals. The rest were never found. A lot of times when these, especially when a Ming farm raid happens, the fur industry will put out a press release, and they'll spread a lot of propaganda saying the animals were hit by cars, um, that the animals can't survive in the wild and die of dehydration. Um, but in a federal case, you get what's called discovery, which is all the evidence against you. And they take a picture of everything, every broken cage, every sort of, you know, any kind of damage to the property. They didn't have a single picture of a dead animal. They didn't have a single picture of an animal that was hit by a car. They didn't have a single picture of a perished animal. So that tells me that a lot of these fur industry um, press releases or talking points are just uh, lies. I think that mink are absolutely able to survive in the wild. Oh, that's incredible. Thank you so much. Thank you. So you said breeding stock. What Can you define what that means for anybody who's not sure? So every, every fur farm has a, um, a, a stock of breeders that they use to sort of, um, uh, you know, increase the pelt quality. I mean, you know, some of these I read at auction some of these, uh, a single animal pelt went for $100,000. So they're always trying to mess with these uh, genetic pelt strains and get a better quality pelt. And so the breeding stock are strictly used. They're not killed in the pelting season. All the other animals are gassed and killed, but the breeding stock are, are essentially just the breeding machines that these, that these facilities use. And uh, once they're gone, uh, unlike a vivisection lab or a pig farm where they can just call up Charles River Labs or whatever uh, industry supplier and order a new stock, they don't have that option. They have what's called a closed breeding system. Their you know, genetic lines are going back decades. Uh, some of these farms have been around since the 50s. Um, so uh, once the breeding stock is gone, they, they generally pelt out. They, they, that's what's called in the industry, pelting out. They close up. <laughs> So feel free to put more questions in the chat or raise your hand. Um, and I was going to ask you, I don't know if you can answer this, but you know, with, with fur hopefully going away, what do you think the chances are for leather and suede being next or feathers, silk? Any thoughts on, on that? Yeah, I think I think once the once the fur industry is destroyed, and I think it will be destroyed, whether it's in, you know five years or 10 years, it will be, it will be eradicated. Um, I think it's important to go after like, um, maybe niche industries or industries that already have like a, uh, public consciousness against them. Um, so maybe exotic skins would be the next target. They're, they're a very small niche industry and I feel like they're very defeatable. Um, leather, that's what, that's what, that would be a little tougher. Um, so I think exotic animal skins after fur would probably be where the movement should focus its energy. Exotic animals. I, like... to answer, um, I did want to answer Julia's question in the chat. She said, how do you identify the breeding stock? So um, mink are housed in open-ended sheds, you know, in, in rows of cages. Um, the breeding stock will have breeding cards either affixed to the cage or like on top of the cage. So look for that breeding card and that will that will tell you um, which animals are the breeders. And those are the ones that are worth the most money. Like there was a fur farm in, um, Massachusetts that, um, activists broke in and released 500, um, of the breeding stock and it caused $500,000 of damage to the fur farm and the farm shut down almost immediately. So that's the most effective way. I hope this I hope this is inspiring activists my our wheels are turning are there any uh from the chat are there any legal restrictions placed on your activism as an ex-con I think we had that question um there were like I said where I was on probation from 2018 to 2020 so and that's very restrictive like one of my probation conditions that I not post on activist websites um 
so I couldn't really do any activism on probation, but once I got off, I mean, I'm kind of in the same boat as everyone else. Maybe, maybe a little more of a target from police agencies. You know, maybe they see me as someone that's more of a thorn in their side or, you know, that this, this guy's a, this guy's a felon. He shouldn't be here, but no, as far as like actual legal restrictions, no. Good. Uh, and Juan asks, what are your thoughts on simultaneous efforts like going after exotic skins now and not waiting until fur collapses? Should we do two, two at once or wait? I think that's up to how people feel, what, what your collective feels, what the group, what the, what the activists you're working with feel. Um, yeah, I mean, if you know, I feel like we should unify as an activist movement as much as possible. So if we have every single city working on one target, they'll fold much quicker than if we have, you know, five or six different campaigns against different industries. Um, but as far as fur, I mean, I feel like these campaigns are winning so fast that we might not have to wait long for, <laughs> for the exotic animal skin campaigns to really go into full effect. Like, you know, no one really thought that Neiman Marcus would fold in two months. I didn't think that Montclair and Dolce and Gabbana would fold in the same week. So, um, you know, we might not have we not we might not have to wait long for that unification of the activist movement against uh against the other industries. Where are exotic animal skins sold the most, and what exotic um, animals? I believe Hermes is is one that's selling uh crocodile skins. There was an undercover investigation that I saw that was pretty horrific. Um, yeah, there, that would that would probably be one of the first targets that we should go after after we finish off fur. <laughs> and Julia asked something. I was wondering the same thing. Is there any risk of us posting this workshop on YouTube? I guess you would have told us by now, but is no, I don't think so. I mean, out just being so open. Yeah, I mean, I obviously I'm not. I'm just talking about my experiences and sort of my activism. I'm not really trying to inspire or encourage illegal activity or assist in any illegal activity. I'm just, uh, I'm just sharing my experience. I mean, it's a closed legal case. So I think it's, I think it's safe to do so. Gotcha. That's the line that you do not cross. Not no, you can't. Right, right. Care you're very careful. Yeah. Gloria, you have your hand up. Gloria, you want to ask your question? <clears throat> you have to unmute. I think she's muted. Yeah. Gloria, you have to unmute. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Now I can. Okay. Yes. With regards to our next target, I'm just curious, has uh, people behind the scenes, have they, um, have they already been trying to talk to Louis Vuitton to try to get them to stop uh, uh, selling fur? Or can you say? Or, you might that I wouldn't know. Say. I know that. That I wouldn't know. I know that CAF sort of coordinates the pressure campaign and then maybe there's um, talks behind the scenes with like Humane Society and PETA at some point. I'm sure they've, I'm sure they've opened up those discussions already, you know, especially with all the recent victories, we can sort of say, well, you know, you're, you're one of a few, you're on your own here. And, um, you know, I, I think, uh, I think there's a chance that some of these companies will fold without even much of a campaign against them just because they see the writing on the wall. But uh, yeah, yeah, I'm, I'm just, I'm would, yeah, yeah, I definitely think because we're, plan, we're planning to we're planning to to do a something. So I'm just curious if they already have kind of an idea, you know, if they people have been talking to them behind the scenes. Thank you. Sure. Yeah, I'm sure that HSUS and PETA have opened up those lines of communication with those companies. Sure. Thank you. Uh -huh. So Jenny McQueen also, oh, Gloria, go ahead and mute yourself. Oh, it's grassy, thank you. There's a Hermes campaign happening with the crocodile skins. So she's just reminding okay. us that there's a hashtag, hashtag drop croc. So if people awesome. want, want to use that and, and do some posting around that, um, that was great. And Doug, who joined us a little bit late, asks how important is political pressure, pressuring the politicians to change laws or is that not the um, most effective? 
I, I mean, there are people that work on that. I think that it's up to the individual to decide where they think their energy can be placed best and where they think, what do they think is most effective. Um, there has been success with that. I know with like city fur bans, Brookline, Massachusetts, uh, Ann Arbor, Michigan, ban the sale of fur. Um, it can be useful. I mean, you know, sometimes all it takes is getting a few sympathetic, you know, knowing your council members, knowing where they stand, um, if they're, you know, friendly to animals, if they're progressive, and then sort of maybe you can just ask them to push forward with, you know, a circus ban or a fur ban, and it might be as quick as just a city council vote that gets passed through pretty easy. So it all, I think that depends a lot on your jurisdiction, what state you're in, what city you're in whether the politicians are going to be sympathetic to you. Ina, you have your hand up. You want to ask a question? Yes, it's Ina. Um, a question is, do you think that it is um, more effective to do these releases or to go after governments to ban for altogether? Um, I think that, I think that both are necessary. I think we need a diversity of tactics. We need, we need protests. We need, we need petitions. We need direct action. We need, pro, you know, we need all of it. Every tool in the toolbox kind of approach. Um, they've had some great successes with other countries banning, uh, fur farming. I don't see that happening in the U S I mean, especially in light of like Sonia Shah's recent piece, in the New York times, everyone should read that. Um, she talks about how, you know, even with the COVID outbreaks on fur farms and how that was affecting workers, you know, the USDA and the government took no precautions at all. Um, but, you know, other countries were very quick to just end this industry. Like we can't, we can't accept this public health disaster. Um, I think on a small scale, you know, pushing your city to, to ban fur um, can be very effective. That's been used in, you know, many cities. I think Hollandale Beach, Florida was another one that I left out that recently banned the sale of fur. So there's sort of a, they're working in Austin, where I live, Austin, Texas, they're working on a city fur ban. So, and Brian so that'd be California. Cool. And what are the other countries? Israel, Israel is one. And what are the other countries? Um, yeah, Ireland recently banned uh, fur farming. Uh, fur farming is banned in the UK. Um, Estonia, I can't even keep up with all the countries. Denmark, I mean, it seems like a lot of these European countries are are just getting out of the fur industry because I think COVID had that had that impact of you know there's there's proof of cross species contamination, COVID to humans, and uh, uh, I think that was a lot of the nail in the coffin for a lot of these industries uh, for a lot of these countries for industry. Great. Any information people have about that off the top of their heads, please go ahead and keep putting it in the chat, along with all the great links that people are sharing. So thank you so much for being so knowledgeable to our attendees as well. So any, so any more questions for Joseph while we have him about his experience, about tips for activism, you know, any other, do Shannon and Evan have a question? Yeah, I do. I had to step away for a few moments, so I apologize if it was brought up at all. But I was wondering if, Joseph, if you've considered doing work within the prison system, I've had some ideas for a long time um, of like, I, I would think it would be a really cool, more controlled setting where if um, the prisoners were given the opportunity to like watch a couple of the documentaries like I think the game changers would uh, be a good one for them and then they had the option to like join a program where they would be fed all plant-based food and taught some skills like um, you know meditation and had the ability to do yoga and some other things I feel like it would be great to be able to get data uh, based on like you know their blood work and and how the plant-based diet affects them and it would be really cool to see if it affects the behavior and the way that the people act with each other um, if they were to be able to be kept separate from the population who didn't decide to participate and then um, just benefit them in so many ways and I think they'd come out and and really have um, an, a nice understanding and want to be a part of the movement too but I don't know if you've ever considered any of that. 
Yeah, totally. I think that's that's crucial work. Um, I know in the UK in the past there were a lot of um, there was like the ALF prisoner support group and the vegan prisoner support group that uh would sort of you know pressure the uh the prisons and the jails to provide more adequate vegan meals and vegan options in the in the prisons and jails. And so a lot of the a lot of the political prisoners in the past talked about out of the UK talked about like you know how they had prisoners on their cell block who were going vegan because it was more accessible um, in the U.S. Not so much. Um, I know there's been some litigation around that issue, like access to vegan food on, you know, religious grounds or access to, to proper vegan diet on, you know, ethical grounds, but I'm not too um, knowledgeable about that kind of work that's being done, but yeah, it's definitely essential. It's definitely like, um, yeah, because I felt like I felt like the the vegan diet I was eating in prison was so inadequate that like it didn't really appeal to anyone and then like they would see me just like subsisting on oatmeal and peanut butter and ramen noodles and like it was woefully inadequate and so like you know it was just to a lot of the prisoners it just seemed like this arduous task to stay vegan and that definitely has to change it should be a you know it should be a practice that the you know the prison makes much much easier for prisoners. Can I just add to that? I want to ask, um, from the facilities, the, the you, I think you said you were at six different ones. Um, if one of the prisons, I, I don't know whether you were at private or um, all um, public, but um, do you think they, if they wanted to participate in something like what I described, would they typically have the ability, um, enough land where prisoners might be able to um, help with gardening and learn skills and things like that? Or is that typically not the type of properties that these are on? Um, so, yeah, I think some facilities are. I know um, one of the facilities I was at at Lompoc had a dairy farm. <laughs> and so that would, that might be, that might be something useful that someone like someone could work on is sort of transitioning that to like, you know, plant-based agriculture. What, what was the name of that one? Uh, that's FCI Lompoc. That was one of the first facilities I spent time at. It's in California. L-O-M-P-O-C. Maybe you guys should talk after this workshop, right? You and Shannon, totally. Shannon and Joseph for sure. Yeah, awesome. Wow, great, great stuff, great stuff coming into the chat. Is there maybe a, a, another question or um, maybe just briefly, does anybody attending want to just share a very brief experience of their own with being imprisoned or, or supporting a prisoner or even just a takeaway? Does anybody want to share a little takeaway what you're going to take out of this workshop and maybe go forward with anybody? Julia, and then Myra, I think. I know me personally, I'm definitely um, committing to starting to support some um, prisoners. So sending letters, maybe a book or a packet. I know that's, yeah. Great, Myra. That's awesome. Thank you. Yeah, I guess I just, came out uh, leaving more informed. Like, I guess I didn't realize how quickly it is to empty a fur farm in, and be able to save so many lives. So that's just, that's just amazing to see that that type of action is pretty quick and can save so many lives. So thank you, Joseph. Yeah, I also kind of wanted to plug um, real quick. I, on Instagram, um, Instagram, my Instagram handle is Joseph Buddenberg, just my full name. Um, and I share a lot of like historical direct action stories um, that a lot of people that, you know, aren't aware of um, just amazing, um, you know, amazing actions from history that, you know, 90s, 2000s, uh, where people emptied fur farms, empty laboratories, uh, ended industries, essentially. Um, and I also have a Patreon page. So patreon.com, Joseph Buttonberg, where I share a lot of that same history videos and 
just historical footage from um, effective ALF actions mostly. Just so, so you people know can learn more about coming up. No. No. Sorry. Sorry for interrupting. Okay. I just wanted to let you know. I'm not yeah, I think people. Maria just put it in the chat. His Instagram handle. It's it's there. And if it, if that's not correct, go ahead. Anybody else need to put his information there? That would be great. Thank you, Myra, for for uh, we're all inspired. I think Jenny McQueen is with us. So do you want to add anything, Jenny? Um, yeah, I've I've had experience in police holding cells. Um, quite a few times and with police bureaucracy uh, and I found you know trying to keep my temper uh, and not get angry with the authorities is can be quite a challenge I just wonder uh, whether you found that as well Joseph um not so much I, the I think the more difficult thing that people should prepare for is uh not talking because when when you're arrested you kind of have to maybe do some performance visualization around not talking because they'll they'll try every trick in the book to get you to talk like uh i was waiting for a judge on my initial arrest for like two hours and i would ask them to loosen the cuffs and they would tighten them and uh they would try to start making small talk just to get me to start opening up you know so that's important just to remain silent and um, I felt like if I expressed anger or if I started, you know, um, asking questions, then that would just sort of open them up to, you know, feeling like we could we could have a chat. Um, I just kind of sat with my arms crossed and stared at them until until it was time to see the judge. Thanks, Malcolm, for that. No one talks, everyone walks. <laughs> but yeah, it's definitely an emotional experience, and it definitely uh, it's definitely um, something that induces a lot of anger. Yeah, that's so why as activists, we really have to learn how to manage our emotions and manage dystopia and manage the stress. And, you know, that's just so key to being successful. Self-care. Yeah, good self-care. And know that there's, you know, tra the secondary trauma that we experience for the animals is, is real. Yeah. So, gosh, great. Um, so if there aren't any other questions. Can I ask one more? Yeah. I'm sorry. I, I looked this prison up and I typed um, dairy farm after it. And this is so disturbing. There's like an article from NPR back in 2014. And I was just wondering, Joseph, if you know, do the prisoners get to pick their position? Are they part of the AI process? Do they know that the babies are being taken away? Like it, the, the, article here is titled prison dairy gives inmates job skills and a sense of purpose and i just i mean these are female animals being completely exploited for the reproductive system this seems so insane yeah i've heard of other i've heard of other um in illinois state prison that has like an on-site slaughterhouse for inmates um and i think the way that that works is like generally um in prison, I mean, it wasn't something that I really had to worry about because I had so much outside support and I had so much movement support, but a lot of times prisoners are sort of dependent on these jobs. And so, and a lot of the jobs will pay like 18 cents an hour or something. So um, the Unicor jobs will pay more. And maybe one, one way that they incentivize working on the dairy farm is maybe they offer a dollar an hour or something, which, you know, is still an egregious illegal wage, but, um, I think they probably have to incentivize that work. And I don't think you're necessarily able to pick your position. You probably just are assigned something. It's not a lot of, not a lot of agency allowed amongst inmates. Wow. Yeah, so much exploitation of humans and non-humans. So I guess we're gonna kind of look to wrap up then. Joseph, do you have any final words? What would you like to leave us? Uh, yeah, I mean, I. I would just encourage people to keep fighting in ways that they find most effective. Um, right now, I think these these fur victories have been amazing, and these fur campaigns are are where we should uh, unite as an activist movement and really really end this industry. Like I never even envisioned that we could potentially have the end to the fur industry in my lifetime, and now it seems like it's almost definite. So I would just encourage encourage folks to to figure out their skill set and where they can put their you know 
their tools and their energies in the most effective ways possible. Great. So go ahead and put more of your takeaways in the chat. Those are wonderful final words, Joseph. And so before we go, I do want to make a couple of announcements on behalf of AAM. We have more upcoming workshops on Thursday, February 3rd. We have an Iditarod dog sled racing workshop. On Thursday, February 10th, we have a workshop with Hope Bohanek. Humane, wa humane washing our food, cage-free, free-range, humane, what the labels really mean. On Thursday, February 17th, we have a workshop on establishing an AR organization with Alex Hershap from Farm. And on Thursday, March 3rd, we're having a workshop with Ina, one of our mentors, on effectively using social media for activists. And stay tuned, we have plenty more workshops coming. We also have a big announcement it's not too late to sign up and come to our Atlanta Assembly. The Atlanta AAM Atlanta Assembly is an eight-day animal rights event, live event hosted by AAM. We are gathering in Atlanta, Georgia this time, February 19th through 26th. And the goal behind the Atlanta Assembly is to educate aspiring activists on the importance of different forms of activism, which are all planned and organized already. Activists of all skill levels will be getting hands-on experience side-by-side -side with experienced activists, uh, pressure campaigns and visiting vigils and disruptions um, and, mu and much, much more. So if you want more information about that, you can reach out to any mentor. You can go to our website. You can uh, go on Facebook for, go to our page, AAM's page group and look for the Facebook event on, it's the AAM Atlanta Assembly. Come stay with us in the activist house, even. So again, thank you, Joseph, for thank you, Joseph, for your time, your knowledge, your experience that you share so genuinely um, and and so uh, courageously with us today. Um, thank you, Trey, for working the technical back end. Shout out to Trey. Everybody, say thank you to Trey. And again, if you're interested in becoming a mentor, a mentee, or getting more involved with AAM, please visit our website, animalactivismmentorship.com. Okay, thank you. Awesome. Thanks for having me. That's great. You. Thanks everybody for coming out, yeah.